Hi, welcome to tonight's lecture. Um, I have the pleasure of introducing tonight's lecture, Anna Puihane of Mayo Architects. Um, Anna is an architect, researcher, and editor. She's co-founder of Mayo, an architectural office that has that's based in both Barcelona and New York. Her practice engages a wide range of projects from, a ha from housing blocks and urban planning to furniture, exhibition design, and publications. Uh, Maya works on flexible systems where notions such as variation, the ephemeral, and the ad hoc permit theoretical positions to materialize. Their work engages activating devices, doors, windows, furnishings, rooms, and objects to sponsor forms of public gathering and social exchange. In their project, in their project Rooms No Vacancy, which was their 2014 Young Architects program entry, they offer the public a continuous succession of different atmospheres, groups, and conversations um, deployed in a grid activated with a series of kind of attractor objects. In the grand interior at the 2017 Chicago Architecture Biennial, interiors and objects are foregrounded to provoke reflection on the work of the interior. Architecture is made minimal and the interior as architecture is brought into focus. In her book, The Kitchenless City, The Role of Housing as a Tool for Social and Urban Transformation is reactivated with a proposal for a new collective kitchen typology. She was awarded the prestigious Wheel, Wheelwright Prize in 2016 by Harvard's Graduate School of Design for this ongoing research. Mayo has an extensive list of awards, speaking engagements, and recent exhibits, including architecture effects at the Guggenheim Bilbao, 44 low-resolution houses at Princeton's, um, Princeton's School of Architecture, and Tempietto um, ex Exemplum at Yale's School of Architecture. Anna is currently teaching at the Graduate School of Architecture Planning and Preservation at Columbia. Please join me in welcoming her to UCLA. Thank you very much. Um, thank you everyone for being here. Uh, it's a nice crowd. Uh, thank you, Heather, for uh, such a deep and nice introduction. You really um, went through a lot of things that I even didn't remember. I was like, wow, yeah, we did that. <laughs> so um, it was a nice um, sum up. And uh, I'm really happy to be here. Um, it's a school that I admire because I have many friends teaching here, people that I, I do really um, like uh, their work and the way they teach. So I feel uh, really comfortable be back um, and uh, actually uh, I think it was a couple of years ago I actually don't remember um, the architectural magazine pool that you might know is a uh, magazine that is produced here at the school um, and run by the students they ask us um, to reflect on our production and um, to to put together all those design rules that we have been um, doing in the last years and to try to understand what was behind those rules. And um, so at that moment, it was quite clear that our our practice was based on that, like how to design rules, instructions of use, orders, formats that allow things to happen. Maybe it was not that clear when we started. So it was it's something that has been built in a quite an unconscious manner. But for us, it was a really nice question that allowed us to understand at the end of the day what, we're, what, are, what, what do we do. So everything that I'm going to present tonight, it can be summed up with this. Um, the game of architecture is defined by rules. It's what we do. We make rules in order to break them. 
But always we have to remember that rules have footnotes, and that's the most important thing. And be aware of, of, of the condition of working like that, so that we always design things that are per se ephemeral because they have the potentiality to change through time and be transgressed, be broken, um, change radically. We, we always have to be aware of, of the ephemerality condition as well as of the unfinished condition of everything that we do. We, we had from the beginning of the office this, this sentence that we always repeat ourselves. It was a sentence that we made up just to cheer us up. It means, uh, no quedará nada de todo esto, means nothing will last from all of this. And we, we wanted to quote that every time that we, you know, we were in a crisis or something, or we were, you were like, you, you want to do the best thing ever, and you're like, hey, don't worry, nothing is gonna last from all this. So do whatever you wanna do. And uh, it started as a joke, and at the end, uh, we were aware that actually it really defined the way we understand our work, because we, we are aware that everything that we do is not gonna last, because it has the nature of not lasting. And um, so it ended up being ac actually a piece that we exhibit in a gallery, being a, um, more kind of an art piece, an architectural piece. And um, so collectors is there in the market. And, uh, and but at the end, it has been a rule that it's really important in our practice. And um, I, I, we always start, uh, most of the lectures, we always uh, start lectures explaining how we, we start because it, it really defines the way, or at least explains why we understand architecture from that perspective. Uh, we opened the office in 2012, but we started thinking about it in 2011 when uh, when um, the crisis in Spain was already really hard, and it it it, it produced this um, set of, of of images that uh, that um, that um, show um, how the cities and how the public spaces of most of our cities were being occupied. Um, our cities were filled with riots, strikes, and, uh, and social uh, demonstrations that claim uh, a social change that go beyond the, um, the, an economy, the idea of an economical change. But it was actually a radical um, perception that our society had, had to change, or at least it had to change the way it was being understood and it was being operated. So with that, with, in that atmosphere, we got together a bunch of friends. Um, we, got, we, we took a uh, ground floor in the neighborhood of Gracia in Barcelona, and we furbished it with the aim to you know, share basically the space. Of course, it, there was an economical purpose behind it, just you know, to decrease our expenses that, so that we could keep on going. But at the same time, there was the need of uh, sharing just in order to have an open discussion that could allow us to redefine our own disciplines. We were coming from dis different disciplines, maybe all related is true, all related somehow to architecture. So from uh, engineering to, to design, to landscaping, etc. And we all had kind of this need to talk and in order to redefine how, in our case, how architecture was being produced until then. So what we did was, uh, it was an all, um, an old uh, laundry place, um, and uh, it was really large, uh, really deep, really narrow, no light at all. And with our um, a really tight budget, what we end up deciding to do was just to uh, take out a roof and a floor of, uh, of an existing room to bring uh, light inside the space. And actually, the room itself divided the, this long space into two areas radically. The front area has been always left empty and open to the public in order to, to engage exhibitions, events, etc. So it has this kind of cultural uh, condition. And the back space is where we actually work. It's defined by this 12 and a half meters long table where we all gather. And, um, and uh, for us, it, it has been surprisingly um, successful because at the beginning we all thought that it was going to be a temporary thing, so something that we, you know, would live for a while and uh, move on after that. And, uh, and we realized that um, the, the format of the table, not only at the end, it has defined the way we all work. So suddenly, uh, higher, like, 
work is produced more in an horizontal level. We share more easily our projects. We uh, blur a bit the limits between each office thanks to the, the format itself. So suddenly we were aware of, of the, 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 the relevance of, of formats, but also at the end, in our case, not only define a way of working, but it define a way of architecture itself. It define a way of understanding the practice. So since then, we have been always upset to define architectures that allow things to happen. And they are open enough to uh, allow change and growth to, uh, through time. We start working in that way with our first commission. Um, we won a competition uh, for the city council, and we were asked as a response to, to uh, design a urban space in the middle of the city. At the time in Barcelona, there were a lot of empty lots that uh, couldn't be built. So there were lots that were uh, buildings should be built, but couldn't be built because of the lack of uh, budget, of the econ because of the economical crisis. And in order to avoid the decay of those areas, the city council asked a set of architects to design a urban space that could be ephemeral, so that could last just a short period of time. Meanwhile, the economy could get better. And um, and as you know. We, we went through the uh, regular process despite the particularity of the of the of the of the question of the request we went through a, a public participation process to ask neighbors what they wish and desire for that uh, space and uh, you have to imagine 2012 we were still in a, and nowadays I would say that we are still in a deep deep social crisis so and where we we had to face um, uh, you know uh, a set of, of, of neighborhood groups that w they were really mad. They were really mad with everything. Neighbors, the other neighbors, other group neighbors, but also mainly politicians and how everything was defined. So at the end of this uh, public process, we couldn't really achieve an agreement that was actually uh, useful. So we received a long list of wishes that we couldn't actually answer to. And we were asked as ask architects to you know, solve the situation with a really few money. So what we ended up doing as a, as a response was basically to do almost nothing. So we b decided to build a lit, uh, grid of lighting poles um, that were placed in a way that all the uses that were asked could happen, but in the future. And we, leave, we, we left the space as that, so mostly empty, just a, a ground with sun and a lot of lights, lighting poles. We decided to, 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 to go for lighting poles because in Barcelona, if you don't light a space, a public space, it ha this has to be fenced and therefore it's not public with its consequential uh, economical cost. The reaction was really but we were in all newspapers as the worst public space ever in Barcelona. Like uh, suddenly we were aware of uh, you know the not acceptance of the unfinished. So the fact that it was unfinished, it was really not well accepted. Neighborhoods wanted something done. You know they didn't want something to be built through time. So the reaction was really bad. Uh, but um, what it was really beautiful at the end of the day, uh, after you know uh, being uh, a bit shocked uh, with the reaction, it was suddenly a real process of uh, public participation that started to happen. So suddenly a real dialogue started to emerge to really uh, agree and make those social pacts that allow that growth to happen. We designed a set of instructions for neighbors to allow them to know which legal things they could do, which things could be built, and how to do that, with the aim to step backwards and let them grow the square through time. So after a year, um, the square looked like this. We should take pictures probably of the actual status because it's really different. So after a year, they plant trees, they agree to place a statue at the back, they, they agree to place some benches, um, and the, the square is still nowadays growing and changing. So at that moment, we understood the potentiality of our instructions of use and allowing this openness to happen. In, this, in the same moment, we, were, we received uh, one of also our first commissions. Um, we received the commission to design a restaurant in, um, in the city council, in, in the center of Barcelona. 
And uh, the commission was quite clear. They wanted to design a Catalan restaurant, so a restaurant that could have the identity of Catalan food. And, uh, and, uh, and we had to answer it in a way that they could actually replicate that I special identity in other spaces and other locations without losing the identity itself. So we started with uh, collaborating with uh, with uh, with uh, graphic designers to um, you know understand what Catalan food means, and of course, we, Catalan we are really simple. Uh, our dishes are really simple, always based on you know simple elements. Our main dish is the pan tomacat, which is bread with tomato, as simple as that. It's not complicated at all, but we're really proud of it, and it's considered something really exquisite. And we start to imagine, okay, if that's our identity in relation with food, which is our identity in relation of, of architecture. And uh, you might disagree, but if you ask any Catalan, we think that balls, we invent balls, you know? So balls are ours. I know that uh, it's not true, and we, are, we, know, we all know that it's not true, but we are, at the end of the day, really proud of, proud of it. So at the end, you realize that identity is a cultural construction that not necessarily is related with uh, a, a, a pure truth, but it's always uh, a fake truth. Uh, so, uh, understanding that the vault is our identity, we decided to go for that and just define um, a system of, of, of bolts that could uh, be applied in different locations and that could define a spatial identity uh, that at the end of the day it could have its own particularity by the fact that this system would crash on persisting limits and therefore generating different forms in different locations. So with the project, we started to understand um, the capacity of, of, um, of what happens when one system interacts with another system, or what the capacity of one system interacting with a persistent reality. Of course, we wanted to, to, to communicate that everything that we were communicating as a spatial identity or a Catalan spatial identity was a tale or a, you know, a fake construction. So we made that clear in the entrance, showing the theatricality of the space. And of course, that's related with a lot of uh, references that we had at the, uh, on the table about uh, um, you know, forms that interact uh, persistent forms, orders that didn't interact uh, persistent um, orders. And that is something that we uh, put into practice as well in a project that, uh, in a gallery in Buenos Aires, in Mon Ambiente Gallery. They asked us to, to participate in, a, in an exhibition about instructions of use and to propose an installation that could reflect on that. So with that aim, we started collecting uh, books that could um, talk about that or reflect about that. Of course, uh, Dom Cook books and many others came into the table. And uh, looking at the uh, the last, uh, when looking at the World Health Catalog, we found out uh, a dome designed by in the World Health Catalog, uh, designed by Buck Mr. Fuller, that it was actually commercialized through Popular Science. Um, and I, at the, during the 60s, and at that time, uh, the dome was basically sold through the magazine and uh, mailed um, through a letter. So the physicality of the dome was reduced to just, you know, a letter that explained the instructions of the montage of this dome. We found out um, that it's patent, um, and we basically what we did was to take the pattern, just um, shape re. You, we touch it just a little bit to um, make it a bit more contemporary, and we send it to the gallery. Uh, knowing, sorry, this is in Spanish, but I'm going to translate. Knowing that actually, what it says here is that the intersection of so knowing that actually uh, that dome, that big bug Mr. Fuller dome, was actually much larger. So the dome was 42.7 square meters was much larger actually than the space of the gallery itself, which was 23.9 square meters, which actually immediately once is aware that it, the impossibility of, about the impossibility of building the dome inside the space. And after sending that, those instructions, we just closed any kind of relationship with the gallery. We stopped uh, asking, uh, answering emails. Um, so, provoking actually an, a response to our instructions of use. Suddenly, uh, the people that run the galleries had to take a lot of decisions. Of course, the material that, uh, that, that DOM was defined in the, and that the pattern defined couldn't be, um, 
uh, achieved uh, by contemporary means, but also uh, with the limited budget that they had. So they had to improvise. And they, instead of metal bars, they used uh, wood um, stick broom, um, from uh, brooms, uh, you know, um, plastic as, as the joints instead of a complicated metallic joint, et cetera, et cetera. But the most important thing, they had to decide which part of the dome to build. So we force, at the end of the day, uh, an appropriation um, raising the concern or the capacities of instructions of use. So any instructions of use has the capacity to be appropriated, appropriated and transgressed and transgress it. And actually that capacity, it's part of the nature of the instructions of use and it's actually something positive in a sense that it generates things, it's creative. Um, also during that time, and I'm explaining this project kind of in parallel, but you'll see that they're somehow all connected. We were commissioned to design an exhibition space, a uh, display of an exhibition in the Museum of Contemporary Art. It's actually a project that I mentioned, the project that I mentioned yesterday in the symposium. And, um, and we were asked to design uh, the display for an exhibition dedicated to George Perec, uh, to particularly to his book, Species of Spaces. And the exhibition had to happen in that round um, room of the Richard Myers building, a really complicated room. Actually, nobody wants to exhibit there because its, its size and its volume is really, really difficult to, to, to work with. And we were asked to turn it into a domestic space in order to relate uh, with those chapters of the book that are um, about domesticity. So with that aim in mind, we uh, radically chopped the space into smaller rooms, um, equal rooms, as you know, establishing a system on the top of something that is already preexistent, similar to what we did with the restaurant. And. Um, and at that time, uh, we got um, this art piece, um, a spook story with that characters, is from Nicholas Reck. And, uh, and we were really fascinated by this. Um, suddenly, what, he, what the artist did was just, um, it was a reenactment of the, Donic, uh, of the comic, of Donald Duck comic. And what he did basically was to erase all kind of characters, personages, anything that was written on the cartoon, just to, to produce a sense of abstraction Suddenly, everything that was until then on the back became on the front, and suddenly any story could happen within the same frame. And we were fascinated by that capacity, how, how to translate that into architecture, how to translate that into the domestic, how to be abstract or generic, in other words, into the domestic. And we, we, we wanted to raise this concern, basically, also it was a response to how housing was being produced in Spain until then, where most of our typologies just respond to one typology, to one um, social type. Most of our typologies are defined by a large living room, a large bedroom, and a smaller uh, beds, bedrooms. Uh, and most of them are just sold to one specific target, what we could name the prototypical family based on one, two parents and plus one, two children. Meanwhile, our social reality is much wider and, and diverse. And actually, we, we, we know um, that at that time already, uh, just the 24, 27% of our society could respond uh, to that social type. So through the exhibition also, we, we, we wanted to claim the necessity to, uh, to, to develop new types of housing typologies that could be much more abstract or generic and then therefore much more engaging to other social uh, realities. Um, again, we work in a similar way as the public space. We basically define a set of instructions and um, a form of uh, room and how that room should be repeated. And we gave that, those instructions to the curator. And actually, at the end of the day, the curator was the one to define where the windows were placed, uh, where the artwork was placed in order to establish different narratives and dialogues between the pieces. And it was really interesting because uh, he decided to place all the uh, the pieces in relation with the bedroom within the same space. So suddenly it was really interesting to, to, to learn that suddenly the art pieces were the ones defining the character of each of the rooms. So suddenly one room could 
emerge as a bedroom just because of the art pieces that were displayed. Or one room, Salib, was a living room just because of the pieces that were displayed. So what we learn from this work is that actually that we realize that what defines the domestic space is actually the continent, not rather not that uh, that much the con. I, sorry, the content of it, not uh, that much the continent. And with, with that exhibition, actually, we started to be aware of the capacities of mistakes um, and digressions or exceptions that happen when a system collab collides with another one. In this case, for instance, a lot of, uh, of uh, conversations with uh, the curators and other um, um, participants uh, within the process, people from the museum, etc., we talk a lot about um, the fact that we had a lot of useless spaces inside the exhibition. There were a lot of spaces that couldn't be used for anything. You couldn't pass through. You couldn't exhibit anything. And we actually discuss a lot about the necessity of those spaces not to understand that then you have useful spaces instead. So thank for, thanks to the fact that you have useless, you understand the capacity of useful. So a lot of those concerns uh, emerge. Um, through that work, but also a lot of discussions that we still have nowadays in the office that we're um, designing a gallery space um, about the difference between art and architecture. I'm not going to go into that, but that's another kind of com totally no another lecture. Um, and it's interesting to see how that work influenced our housing block uh, that we called 110 rooms. It was a competition that we won um, years ago, and uh, the building was finished two years ago. Or, so, or you know, the time passes really fast. And uh, it's a building place in the Eschample. Eschample, for those that uh, you're not that acquainted with the city, is the neighborhood that um, clearly defines the city that we know nowadays. Um, it's a project that was. Um, design and started to build um, in the late 19th century, so uh, second part of the, of the 19th century. And, uh, and it's this project defined by this um, grid uh, with uh, chopped co uh, corners uh, that uh, theoretically can grow forever and connects all, all towns with uh, the old city. And we have been always fascinated by the capacity of, of, of the grid that despite being so homogeneous, allowed all kind of heterogeneity to happen. Despite being in a quiet order, allow all kind of disorder and chaos and chaos. And there's also it's the, the neighborhood has also another particularity that is really powerful, that is actually has changed through time a lot its uses. So it has passed from housing, that it was actually its original program, to offices and nowadays it's becoming again a housing area and it despite those program those changes in program the physicality of the neighborhood it hasn't changed that much so buildings still look exactly the same and this capacity of change through time uh, is it's possible it has been possible thanks to the the typology that uh, that was defined in the 19th century which um, it's uh, you know defined by this uh, Composition of, of semi-equal rooms to the point that if we don't look, if we don't see the furniture of, of the interior, it's really difficult to distinguish now from our contemporary perspective where the living room was placed, where the bathroom was placed, where the bathroom I, where, where the bedroom, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it has a sense of 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 abstraction that allow any domestic program to happen. And we started to ask ourselves how to define a room, which is the size of this room or the form of this room that allow any domestic program to happen. So that's why we call 110 rooms the building, because it's based on rooms that can that are not predetermined in, in, in its domestic program and can be um, determined uh, by users, by the inhabitants. So each floor at the end of the day was divided in five apartments with five uh, rooms. Um, the kitchen 
uh, can be so any program can happen in any room even the kitchen can be placed in any room and that can happen thanks to the position of uh, the bathrooms where all the supplies uh, run and so electrical supplies AC heating etc and you see that all rooms are connected or they are touching physically with the bathroom and that what allows the flexibility. But also we, we started at the time to talk about the idea of the diffuse house. Um, so those rooms, and that's why we call the building 110 rooms, those rooms can be actually added and subtracted depending on the need of inhabitants, being able to enlarge and decrease the size of each apartment. And we started to claim that idea and how to incorporate that into housing, understanding that our, our need of a space radically changed through time and our lifetime. So we don't need the same size of, of the same amount of space when we have certain age, when we, you know, when we live alone, when we marry, when we divorce, when we live with our parents, when we have children. So how come our houses are not able to answer to those changes? And I'm not only talking about, you know, uh, the possibility of flexible rents, because if you live in a smaller apartment, therefore your rent is increasing, but also the need of taking care of that space when you actually don't need it. And that... Um, that um, idea comes from um, a research that we have been um, developing for a long time about kitchenless living. And particularly end up being um, my PhD um, that I finished in 2014. And, uh, and uh, through the PhD, I basically researched about a type of housing that emerged at the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century in New York, particularly in Manhattan. And uh, that uh, at that time, the house was understood as a system where spaces could be added and subtracted on demand. And not only that, uh, also services, domestic services could be um, um, added on demand. And with that flexibility, in most of the cases, the kitchen was left uh, apart and outside of the home. Um, and most of those apartments had this uh, capacity of adding rooms and substrating rooms, something that we understood that could be actually uh, understood from a contemporary perspective as something that we could appropriate nowadays. Um, the research ended up being called Kitzel City, and everything started thanks to this famous building that you may all know because it appears in this fantastic book written by Rem Kulhas, uh, The Leaders New York. And uh, Rem dedicates a whole chapter to the building. And, uh, you know, Rem, uh, through the book, um, raises this um, imaginary about New York, that about uh, uh, explaining New York as a city that is defined by this grid, where all these marvelous buildings are placed on as, you know, independent identities, but as characters by themselves, where all these huge envelopes uh, used to group uh, extraordinary works within. Actually, he used that word, the city within a city, in many, in many ways. And among others, uh, Waldorf Astoria um, is pictures as such, as an extraordinary world. And I was really fascinated by the fact that it's a building composed by an, by an hotel that uh, is uh, pl placed in the first floors. And then we have a set of uh, kitchenless apartments, so apartments without kitchen, on the top of that hotel. And uh, those apartments are served thanks to the collective, so the hotel kitchen, and as well as many other uh, auto services. And at the beginning, I thought I was going to do a PhD just about that building. I was so obsessed, you know, like gossip, because it's a really gossip building. Even nowadays, when Brad Pitt, not nowadays, already years ago, when Brad Pitt and Angelina Jolie split, one of the main, you know, discussions was the apartment hotel, uh, what to do with the apartment hotel from the, uh, at the world of Astoria that they had. So it's still nowadays, you know, a, a thing that it's, uh, it's a, build, a housing block, that it's on media. You can actually trace who were living there, in which epochs, which times, etc. And suddenly I started uh, questioning myself, how come that kitchenless uh, lifestyle emerged? And I started looking backwards and tracing. And suddenly I realized that, meanwhile, we could actually agree that the building is quite extraordinary because it is luxurious. And it's quite extraordinary because it's still uh, working, and it was working. Um, I suddenly discovered that the typology as such, so the, 
the fact of being, uh, living without a kitchen, it was actually quite common and ordinary. I started collecting hundreds of, of, of similar buildings that operate in a similar manner. And it was, uh, and, and, they, and I discovered that they happened between um, 1871 and 1929. I'm not going to go too much in, deep into the research today, but it, it, you know, like, like almost 60 years of, of existence, it was a way, a life type, a life, a, a way of living quite, uh, quite uh, rooted and, and, and popular. And like this one, uh, that uh, we can see that the apartments have just two rooms and a bathroom, two extremely luxurious and large ones, as this one, the Astor, Astor Apartment House, where we have uh, two apartments for, per floor. Many, many rooms, living room, library, dining room, even rooms for the, cyber, the private service. Many, many bedrooms, many, many bedrooms, but no kitchen. Which allow us to understand that the typology emerged not only uh, to reduce housing costs after the Civil War in the US, but also to uh, offer a new type of, of living that was more related with also comfort to avoid the housekeeping annoyances, but at the same time to understand domestic labor as paid labor. Um, I'm just quoting that because it's actually where I'm heading the research, uh, but today is not the day to talk about that. So I'm obs obsessed with domestic labor nowadays. Um, but just at that time, the research, what allow us to imagine is this capacity of the house to be diffused, to be understood as a system. So to, the capacity of be fragmentary, or at least that it should be its nature. Um, as well, when, uh, when we were designing the house in block, we were commissioned to do an art piece, um, an installation, sorry, in an art gallery. Uh, um, in Yerimonti Gallery in New York, and uh, the curators asked us to um, ask a kind of a reenactment of a 1978 Roma Interrupta project. He, they invite a set of architects to deal with uh, Rome again, but in this case, they ask us to design a Roman villa, so a contemporary Roman villa. And for us, it was a you know a shock because we I, I would even claim that we are against uh, the idea of designing villas, uh, like it's a typology that should, should be erased for our wall uh, welfare, uh, sustainability, and et cetera reasons. Uh, but of course, we wanted to be in a gallery in New York, so we accept the commission, uh, trying to answer as best as we could. Um, and uh, But so then, as an answer, we took it from uh, from an, uh, quite an ironic perspective. It was There was no other way to do it, and we bought a, a German book of, of popular houses from the 60s and we start cutting out the rooms. We took those rooms and scattered it on you know, a piece of, of, of color paper and we tried to find Rome, a, a, a map of Rome, but in this case we, we discovered that there's uh, Rome in Canada, so we thought that it was much better positioned than uh, Rome in Italy for our ironic project. And we scattered all those uh, rooms um, and we send this floor plan to the gallery, and alongside this floor plan, we send, we ship this model. That basically, what we did was to extrude the floor plan, the footprint of each room, and we cut out little doors at the bottom with little figures, and uh, to raise um, the ambiguity of the piece. So it was really difficult to this guy to distinguish where the house, where the villa started and ends. It was really difficult to distinguish um, how many inhabitants, or you know, it was really difficult to distinguish if we were actually proposing a building or a house or a city it, by its its ambiguous um, scale character. And at that time, we started to to talk about ambiguity, diffusion in housing. And recently, one year ago, we were commissioned by the Royal Academy in London to um, design an exhibition and an installation that could answer how um, the actual, as, as they call it, the actual invisible landscape, so actual digital technologies and et cetera, are affecting the way we live um, nowadays. And particularly, they ask us to research about London. So it's, it's a proposal 
about London, but at the end of the day, it can be applied to anywhere. So for a year, we start collecting all those apps that uh, could offer um, services for the home. Um, of course, Airbnb is the most popular one, but as Airbnb, we could find a lot of them. Actually, London is the first city in Europe, well, still Europe, um, in uh, in uh, domestic uh, in uh, the use of domestic apps. So it's it, it was quite particular to 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 do this research. And as an answer, what we did was to to uh, buy a set of of, of domestic furniture and 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 devices and appliances um, online and uh, arrange them as a landscape in different spaces of, of, of the museum, even, even outdoor, so even the bathroom was in the urban space. Trees were inside, blurring the perception of outdoor and indoor, public and private, and trying to to raise this idea that at the end of the day, what is the house nowadays is what we actually occupy physically, to the point that our houses nowadays can be expanded and decreased by the use of those apps. In London, many, many people rent their uh, living rooms as offices during uh, uh, work hours to you know, in, um, use uh, the end of the day, the house as a place also of economical income. But as, as those activities and many, many other practices that are allowing us to understand the city as a whole house that is there to be used through the access of and through the use of these this apps. So how this digital invisible landscape is allowing us to realize about the capacity of, of, of blurring the edges between public and private and how those concepts that were such clearly defined during the 20th century are becoming much, much blur uh, what privacy means, what publicity means in relation with the house. But coming back to the housing blocks that I'm going too far away and I haven't finished with that project. One of the tricks that we use as well in that project was um, the use of doors. And it is really a, a simple trick that allows us to do a lot of legal loopholes. In Spain, our housing law obliges us actually, or not that it's, well, it obliges us, but it pushes us and pushes developers to always define that large living room, that smaller bedroom, and that squeeze uh, bedroom for the children. So how to go beyond the law? So the apartment, the housing apartment, that maybe here it's really difficult to explain, but when I, we explain it in Spain, everyone asks us, where, where is the trick? So we did a lot of loopholes, and we use those hoop, and may, most of them are hosted in these rooms in this door, sorry, that allow the ambiguity not only in terms of a space, because suddenly two rooms can become one, just by the fact of opening those doors, but also allow us to be really ambiguous with um, how we explain that this building in terms, in, in legal terms. So living rooms and bedrooms uh, can be um, set in different spaces. And on the ground floor, in a totally opposite manner, uh, we operate in a radically opposite way. Um, we again did a reenactment of uh, the tradition of the neighborhood where um, halls and uh, the, uh, these uh, collective entrances were always uh, shaped and, and, and formalized in a way that could represent the collective. So the value of the collective. And uh, traditionally, it was the, sp the space where the best materials were placed, uh, the better space were placed. So we, we work in the same way to try to get the most of the space. Um, and in a quite theatrical manner, place uh, the materials in a way that the perception of that the space was l actually larger. So that, that's why we use different colors. Um, and what is actually also quite particular of, of, of this uh, entrance hall is that actually the patio that it divides the, the, the housing block in two, it's open to the exterior, so it rains inside. And we wanted to do that not only for the, to have a better quality of air inside the apartments, but also to raise this ambiguity of, between the outdoor and the indoor, between what is the street and what is actually uh, the, the housing building itself. 
And with the facade, we uh, did exactly the same thing. We did a reenactment of the traditional way of composing facades in the neighborhood. Well, the tra well, well, where you could actually most of them you can read the history of the of 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 that place, and uh, traditionally that pla in that place there was um, a, a, an industry of uh, that they used to fabricate gloves. So in a quite abstract manner, we, we, we copy the pattern of the glove on the facade just to allow this kind of secondary readings of, of the buildings um, that allow the building to be quite culturally rooted, especially with those neighbors that knew the history of the place. That's the bad facade. So we, I, for me, it's quite interesting to look backwards and to understand uh, that at that moment we started to work with these two sides of the coin. One that is about the repetition of a space that we could name generic because it looks like you know, it's some it's 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 a specific it's it can be anything, but at the same time we we work with the idea of the specificity. We were commissioned when like you know that 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 was finished one year ago. Um, an exhibition in a design museum uh, that had to show and display a different um, design uh, objects and for that um, what we did was uh, to design to operate in a quite radical um, different manner so we design a spaces for each object and we arrange so a set of spaces that respond to the particularity of the object that was going to be displayed in that space and we um, arrange them on the on the exhibition space in order not to formalize a linearity of the reading of those uh, exhibition spaces and allow the visitor to choose how to meander and gather around. With that aim, the physicality of, of its limit was uh, quite um, light in the sense that it was defined by these cur colored curtains that allow a little bit to, to have the perception of the inside. So when you were coming into the space, you had this kind of landscape of design objects that you actually choose how to relate with um, or how to visit them. And when you were entering into these content, suddenly, thanks to the light um, design, um, the outdoor space was not visible anymore. So that's where we work now. From now on, I'm just going to explain projects that we have on the table. So everything is like hypothesis uh, with a lot of mistakes. So we're all the time dealing with um, the idea of abstraction that at the same time um, has a sense of um, particularity. So uh, this abstraction is low So it has at the same, it, it is generic and it is particularly at the same time. So it allows a, an open reading but it produces a cultural link that allows us to engage with it. And that's what it's abstraction. So we have tried and we, a lot of mistakes that this is a lost competition, really bad project. Do you know, but you see like the, our you know, intentions to mix the grid with the particular in, a, in an apartment that we were doing. Um, we have work in an opposite manner just to use the particular to, to define um, generic spaces. Um, Probably the most successful project that we have done uh, about that is uh, Aguascalientes. That is, um, it's a house, it's a set of housing blocks that we designed for uh, Infonavit, um, the public housing system in Mexico. And it's a project that it has has been curated and lit by um, Tatiana Bilbao, who designed the master plan and uh, and then she actually called a set of offices to work together. Um, so alongside with us, uh, she called um, HHF from Basel, um, Moss from New York, and Derek Delecam uh, from Mexico City. Um, Tatiana, and I'm missing some. Oh, and Dogma uh, from Brussels, from Brussels. And uh, it was really interesting because um, the process of design was quite particular. We were doing these workshops where we all worked together to define the the the. the the whole um, lot, and then also we talk. We had a lot of discussions about what social housing means in that particular context, and actually what social housing means in a contemporary context as well. Um, we defined this grid that actually allowed to connect 
um, two sides of the neighborhood that are actually nowadays quite disconnected. So this um, housing uh, development is also considered um, an important step to bond both neighborhoods that are really, really, uh, um, they have a really conflict uh, uh, relation. One in one side we have a drug neighborhood, in the other side we have uh, the so-called uh, like what we could call a, a, a more pacified neighborhood. So uh, it's it's a quite difficult area to work uh, with. Um, so that's why the the, the development has this. Uh, so the proposal has this um, this trans this porosity and transcendentality. And as you see, we also define this uh, set of buildings that touch together. So and it's. Uh, uh, office would develop a set of them, but not they were at the end mixed together to raise this idea of this sense of of of, of town scale. So uh, to getting closer to the fabric that is already there. And what we propose as a typology is similar to the 110 housing block. So we basically define this. Um, um, system of rooms that uh, are uh, similar in size and form that can expand and decrease adding or subtracting uh, rooms. We change the position of, of the doors as you might see instead of being central as the housing block we place them in the corner to raise much more uh, the ambiguity and the flexi and the capacity of connecting in different directions. So, thanks to the fact that the door is in the corner, you can connect in that direction, in that direction, or in that direction. So, to um, to raise uh, a special um, the, the special ambiguity, and then um, we started to include exceptions within that uh, grid of, uh, of equal rooms through this kind of uh, walls that w didn't follow actually the existing system and to allow uh, through the, those uh, actions a certain sense of particularity within the generic. The construction is extremely simple to allow, uh, you know, uh, to do it by, by with a limited risk uh, uh, budget. Uh, so also, the, the fact that uh, we work with that size of room, it actually responds also uh, uh, to um, efficiency in terms of construction and structure. The idea of uh, to get the best, the most of, of, of the space through, through, through visual um, perception that actually you have seen also in 110 rooms where rooms had this kind of diagonal viewpoints is also there. And what we start to work with is um, this set of um, what we did um, is that instead of um, placing private terraces, we designed this set of stairs that would uh, have provide access to each apartment. That if you look at them, their 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 form is uh, too large to be just a stair, but it's too too odd to be a private terrace. We did that to be aware of the culture of appropriation. So we are in an area that appropriation is, is, is part of the nature of, of living. So every time that you do a wall, you know that something on that is going to be built. So there's a, this idea that is quite embedded in the culture of appropriation other spaces for private use and also change your house through time quite radically. So in, instead of trying to avoid that, we wanted to empower that uh, with many, with different gadgets. And also to understand that actually that appropriation of the public and collective space demands necessarily a discussion. So if you design it from the beginning, you can allow it like to avoid the discussion or you can actually force the discussion. And in this neighborhood, what we want is the community to, to like the, the neighbors to talk because we have a, a context that is it's quite raw. So we need to kind of raise 
go beyond the idea of the collective and raise the sense of community. And that can just happen when you actually have a problem with your neighbor. So we, through architectural devices, we accept conflict as part of, 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 of you know, the, the nature of a neighborhood and understand the positive side of conflict, what we can get from conflict. So these stairs, what actually they are, they don't, they're not easy to divide. So they're not like a circle or a square that you can easily divide. They're splines, you know, a, a, a forbidden tool in, in, in offices, really bad shapes that uh, they're really difficult to, to fence, but they're, easy to fence if you agree with your neighbor. At the, at the same time, we place four walls on the rooftop with no use. Uh, and of course, we have uh, six neighbors, not eight. So there are four spaces that can be appropriated, but there are six neighbors. So all these architectural um, apparatus, as we understand it, because it has a they have a political agenda behind it. What we think and we expect, we'll see if that happens in the future, is that they can actually allow to improve the quality of living in that area. I'm gonna go through, um, now we have um, the last projects. I have, I brought three projects that are more um, installations and, uh, and uh, they're quite recent. This is an ex ex exhibition that we opened in Garajem in a gallery in Lisbon that we, we work with uh, Buck Gordon and, and, and Jan and Bidler um, Bintayer. And we uh, were asked to, to, to exhibit something in relation of the nature of architecture and especially of architectural construction. So with that goal in mind, what we did was um, the space is called Garajem because it was a former uh, parking lot with a lot of columns. And what we did was instead of avoiding the columns or denying the columns, we actually add more columns, fake columns, that would um, subdivide the space into a smaller, um, into a smaller a scale, so into more domestic uh, areas, where the rest of, of, the, of the works would be displayed, trying to establish different narratives between the work of Buck Gordon and our work, or the work of Jan de Bilder and our work, what happened at the end of the day was really interesting because it, from a visitor perspective, it was really difficult to distinguish who was the author of who and where uh, the Buck Gordon works ended and start, and as well as yeah, and uh, Bilder Bintayek works ended and start. Of course, we wanted to make clear that our columns were real and fake at the same time, so they didn't arrive to the top, uh, allowing that uh, um, const fake construction to, 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 to be clear, or at least glimpses of it. So in that, uh, on that note, um, we have been talking a lot about in the office about nar narratives, and uh, which stories can be um, can be raised or um, happen in our architectures going beyond the physical. And it's something that we already started to work with in our first install in the, in the installation that we did in the first Chicago Biennial, where we built a set of floating columns. We were asked to the, uh, respond to the, art, to the state of the art of architecture, that was the curatorial statement. And in order to respond, what we uh, decided to do was to, to define these characters that were uh, embodied into, into these floating columns that uh, were moving around the space, talking about the other pieces that were on display. Like, we place ourselves in front of Jimenez and uh, criticize it a lot. Uh, maybe he doesn't know, but we talk about your work at that time. And uh, these characters behave as, you know, bodies on the space that they had a word, so they had something to say, sometimes nice, sometimes not, sometimes just gossipy, and they move around the space, rearranging the scale of uh, space in relation with, with the position of the columns. And of course, it was, there was a lot of irony behind it because suddenly a column, that it was formalized as you know, a classical white column, it didn't fulfill its purpose, that it's the main purpose of, you know, holding something and uh, instead of holding weight what it, they hold at the end is just a cultural construction so we were claiming that at the end what 
uh, architecture does is to define cultural constructions. And we have uh, redone this installation recently at uh, Guggenheim Bilbao. Um, in this case, what we did was not to talk about other words, but actually our columns started to, you know, um, not sing, but they were quoting lyrics of uh, popular songs. Um, like, um, yeah, I'm not going to sing. Really, really popular songs uh, that you actually recognize yourself in the lyric. So there was not, there's not actually the need of singing, but just, you know, there's certain words, words that really recalls you to that song. And you, we all have different memories in relation with those songs. So suddenly the relation, the, the opening, the, the open reading that that installation allow, we think that it's actually really powerful of our architecture, going beyond the physical. We were, we are, um, this week actually we are receiving a nice pr uh, prize of this, um, with this piece that we're really proud of. Um, we were commissioned to design an scenography for um, a choreographer. Aymar Pérez Gali, a choreographer that we really admire, so if you don't know him, I would uh, encourage him you to read his books, um, uh, Sweden the Discourse, it's uh, one of his last publications, and he reflects on the relation um, of uh, the body, so the dancer, the choreographer, and the audience. And he asked us to design um, a piece for sonar, the, the electric, the, um, the um, music of electric, of, of electronic music, um, the festival of electronic music, um, that um, that uh, could merge the scenography with the choreography to the point that um, what we, he asked and he was pursuing through the choreography was to blur the sense of the body and to um, to the point that. Um, Bodies could merge in the space, uh, losing the sense of, 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 of its own and uh, going beyond um, the definition of, of bodies and specifically bodies and gender. So it's really a piece that you have to imagine a lot because it was so dark that it's really difficult to picture. There's no images almost. And what we designed was, so the audience was invited to sit down in the platea. And uh, you have to imagine a voice inviting you to take the risk to go through the curtain and enter the space. Of course, when you enter that space, you already felt something odd. It was extremely dark. You couldn't see anything. But as you see, we define a square that was not parallel to the curtain, to the main curtain. So a sense of distortion was there. You could not see anything, but you could feel it. But it was really, really, really interesting. And along the piece, through the piece, we designed a ceiling that was really high at the beginning of the piece and really slowly was going down. The piece lasts 40 minutes. So just until the end, you, you didn't realize about the ceiling but you actually feel that the atmosphere of, it, of the space changed a lot, not only in terms of temperature, but in terms of you know, the feeling of the limit. So you, can, you couldn't see the limit, but you could feel it through many senses. That's the end, probably the end of the piece. Some images, you have to imagine a lot. What is really, really interesting is that, of course, the dancers were inside uh, the space. You could not see them. You could actually not disguise the dancers. It was really difficult to, to know. What is actually really interesting is that we have done this uh, show many times. It has moved from one theater to another. Every time that we have done the show, everyone behaves in the same way. Because everyone reacts to the space in the same way and to the movement of the dancers in the same way. So you always love at the same particular moment. You always align with others in the same particular moment, even if you don't want to and you end up interacting a lot. And of course, suddenly it was really wild, you can imagine, um, a lot of interaction. And I'm gonna end the talk with this piece. It's, um, it's, an, it's, an art, um, it's an installation that we did in an exhibition um, in the Architectural Association of Catalonia. Uh, we were commissioned to design something in the uh, in the gallery that it's placed in this uh, building. Um, the gallery is this one, but usually you don't have the perception of, of the outdoor space because always it's filled with things. 
And we thought that the outdoor space was really interesting. We were asked to work alongside the artist Luz Broto, an artist that we really admire and we actually continue working together, like talking and discussing about things. Um, and uh, we took the money of the installation and we asked a topographer to draw this fantastic uh, space that was front of the gallery to try and to understand what we were going to do with it. And a really stupid thing to do because at the end of the, that drawing we were like, oh yeah, there's two points that are really low and the, actually those points, we have the drainages. And uh, during the exhibition time, it was just one week, um, we knew that during that week pouring rain was going to happen. So we thought it was a great idea to block the drainage of the public system to, and to allow radic suddenly, so to block like that with fake stones and suddenly to allow a, a new landscape to emerge. So we took the floor plan of that topography and we draw this lake. We place this um, floor plan with the lake inside the gallery exhibition, hoping to, you know, waiting for the rain. And uh, as expected, the rain didn't come. Not even a drop of water uh, rain. Nothing happened. You have to imagine this space, hundreds of people, you know. And suddenly, nothing is happening. And uh, it was really like, OK. Uh, but luckily, the, the drawing was there. And suddenly, um, you know, visitors started to speculate and understand the piece. They look outside, they, look, they saw the drainage block, and suddenly, thanks to the drawing, they started to imagine that landscape. And at that moment, we realized that actually that happy accident was really, we were really, exact, really, exact, really lucky because the imagination that that drawing alone, you know, suddenly they, they were Imagine in a, la a beautiful landscape outside. You have to imagine the center of Barcelona. We have a lot of tourists and a lot of people passing by. It's so dirty. I mean, that la that landscape would have not been for sure beautiful. So we we suddenly realized the capacity of not doing, you know, or in other words, doing what it's necessary to do to imagine things. So most of the times they ask us how much our projects change, how are they appropriate, etc. Sincerely, we know, but we don't want to explain or we don't care because we think that the potentiality of it, so to do things that allow things to happen or be imagined, is actually much more powerful than the things themselves. So it's better not to know, it's better to imagine. Thank you very much. I'm going to ask it, but um, thank you for that beautiful lecture. I, I was fascinated the whole entire time. Um, my question has to do with the different, how you would describe the difference between quantity and quality. And I guess I mostly mean that vis-a-vis -vis the generic, which we normally, at least I normally feel like is embedded you know, in the DNA of the notion of the generic, whether it's architectural generic or otherwise, is um, the idea of quantity and the power of quantity. And a lot of the projects, I think, deal pretty overtly with quantity, whether it's, you know, 101 rooms or 110 rooms, I'm sorry, the square footage of rooms and the changing in the same apartment, et cetera, et cetera. Um, then there was this break, at least as far as I could tell, with the last, I think, two projects, which were, seemed so qualitative in nature. So I'm wondering, how would you, de how would you describe the difference between quality and quantity, and how, and how you work with those two ideas? No, it's a really good question, because uh, the, I think that our, our projects are not named that. I th no, maybe they are still. We, we used to. I'm not sure now. Should check the web page. Uh, we used to name our projects by by numbers, so 4.8 per 4.8 room, which at the end of the day allow us to define the whole project based on you know a single thing. So how to sum up a whole complexity with a really few? So numbers for us are important. Of course, the idea of the generic or the term generic, especially here in the states, has as well a really bad. Um, perception because it's related with you know most of our 
um, corporate uh, companies that use the generic as a tool to just you know as a market um, tool and uh, but um, so it has its bad points of course uh, but it also has its good points in a sense that it's um, it also relates with uh, with a cultural construct like with uh, with a cultural sphere so everything that is generic it's also easily um, it can be also easily related with anyone, right? Um, yeah, I think it's just to be aware of the, its capacities and its, uh, its its good points of or and its bad points. And in terms of quality, um, I think that that's what we all want. Uh, quality is the main thing, right? You want to do things right, and. Um, for us all the time, what we try to do, I mean, one of the things that um, we we work with the idea of formats, not only because um, it allows appropriation, etc., but also because it allows us to work in this collective way that we work with. So at the end, we decide, uh, we take certain decisions, and then how those decisions are materialized or, you know, um, built, we don't care that much. It's not that we don't care about materials. We do care, as you can tell. But for us, the main thing I, I think that of the project is the concept behind it. And um, and I'm saying this. I'm getting lost because probably <laughs> that's why we try to reduce our things to to the minimum. And that minimum for us is related with quality. So, for instance, an A4, you know, a format that we all use, well, not here, here would be letters, right? It's, it's, a, it's generic because everyone can use it. It's a format because it can be appropriated by many, you know, in many ways. But it's good. I mean, it's really good design because, you know, like, we all use it. And it seems that it, work, it works, right? So, the quality has to be there in the, in the definition or in the design of the format. Thank you for your super fantastic lecture. Uh, long time listener, first time caller. Um, so I think it's re really great that you mentioned format because it's related to a, a, a reaction that I've been having about your work. Uh, I mean, a very positive reaction. It's actually one of my favorite architecture offices in the world. I mean, but the, the reaction is, you know, you, I mean, the way that Heather uh, introduced you as an editor but I don't necessarily think of you only as an editor of text, but an editor of architecture. Uh, in so far as, you know, let's say um, um, a part of an architecture that gets edited out, uh, a part of an element that gets edited, edited in, uh, and I wonder, um, I mean, which requires a different understanding of notion of context, right? I think, you know, when we say, oh, so, so and so is a contextual architect because they look at site, but context is much richer than that. And I'm uh, wondering, you know, first, uh, what, what do you think when you, when, you know, when you think of yourself as an editor? And second, uh, have you ever encountered situations where you have nothing to edit? The question is well, really well formulated because probably first was an editor, then I was an architect. I mean, it, I was trained as an architect, but then I, I was not interested into I want, didn't want to work in an office, so I end up in academia, I end up teaching. I was not interested in opening an office at all until the crisis. And actually, what we wanted to do was to run a magazine for all of our, you know, even when we were the students. So we were like dreaming about magazines, and stupidly, we ran the kids' competition of, uh, to run the, the Architectural Association magazine, thinking that we were not going to get it, so we put, you know, all of our dreams there. And uh, we won, and we won one year before opening the office, or a few months before. Uh, the office was already like a sense of let's do something, but not that conscious. So I would say that the magazine grew alongside the office, but clearly the magazine was even before the office. And, and, and the idea of formats started there somehow. And maybe at that time we were not that aware how to relate that with uh, other practice, like with buildings, let's say. But for us, clearly, uh, to be aware of uh, that when you run a magazine, the, the format, but not the physical, not only the, for, the physical format, but the content, how you, you, you establish your, you know, your chapters that has to, they have to be repeated in different issues to raise uh, trans, 
transversal narrative uh, between issues, etc. We were really conscious about that. Uh, so, yeah, probably we behave as editors when we do architecture. I have a very pragmatic question. I don't, I, I didn't get the black and white in between images, and I kind of have a feeling yeah. that there's a story about them yeah. that I that I would love to hear because I I. I, I saw parts of different projects in all of these yeah. and I, I wonder where they come from. That's related with the Lisbon exhibition. Uh, we were asked to expose our work. We were like, the work is the installation, the columns, we don't want to show, you know, then uh, printed floor plans, printed, uh, but they really wanted to us to do something. So what we decided in the office, we just do huge models, they're really huge models, but usually there are fragments of of parts of the project, never a whole, and they usually we do them to to design. So they're for us uh, design tools, and um, we have them on the wall. So that as they were so insistent, we just took all the fragments from each project, and we mount them as in a mountain of piles of fragments. And what is interesting of that, what was interesting about that exercise is that actually you could disguise each project despite not being a replica of the project itself. So because at the end it's a, a mountain of, of, you know, fragments and models that were at that time already kind of broken. Uh, one of the threads that go through a number of projects that kind of fascinates me is, is the uh, desire to remove ag the agencies of tectonic um, uh, expressiveness and material um, kind of um, intrinsic material qualities. So the vaults are arcs, right? Mm -hmm. There are all of these kind of uh, media transfers where the vault is an arc which could be uh, part of a kind of font, graphic font component. And the legs of tables are triangles so that one could never uh, identify a line of force. Mm -hmm. And I thought Jason's question was interesting because the theater piece is the first piece where you have a parabolic, like a catenary shape because the ceiling of the piece for whatever kind of uh, reasons of budget is a draped material mm -hmm. surface as opposed to a, an abstract construct. Um, and so I, and you know, because I'm sort of fascinated with columns as well, the fact that you're defying the kind of thermitas of the column at, at, at every turn so those kind of, um, they're almost inside stories where I think, uh, I wonder if the, um, the public, like a, a sort of unknowing participant who might not understand irony, like do you think that every, I think your inside audience understands the irony in certain choices like the, the swept profile in the vault being wrong or the fact that you're interested in a geodesic dome because it's the, the most tectonic thing that can um, eschew all tectonic affiliation. So I just wonder if you think about the relationship of shape to uh, reception because yeah, shape no, um... has such a big part to play in the work. Yeah, I love how you frame it, and um, and it's um, yeah, it's uh, a well addressed. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, so yeah, so yeah, you're totally right, and probably that has been one of the few things that we were really conscious from the beginning, and it's actually a response to our close context. So we start using colors, for instance, because in during our degree in, in the Architectural School of Barcelona, we were not allowed to use colors. 
So when you finish, you know, and you have to do something, you always want to react to something. And we were like, okay, what about colors? Let's try it, you know? And we didn't know anything about colors. And now we're like becoming something, you know, like we know a bit. And colors is a, a huge culture that we lack. So we were fascinated by it. So. Uh, for instance, that was a reaction of our our degree, and also to the fact that um, with the economical crisis, um, for us, color was a cheap way to build in different ways. So to to shape to you know generate different atmosphere just through color, which at the end is the same cost. White is the same cost as as black. So really easily you could you know do different different atmospheres but it also was a reaction to a tendency that respond to the social crisis to the economical crisis through materiality so before we started i would say the late 2000 as an answer to an econom the economical crisis most of my colleagues at that time I started to to claim that um currency in terms of construction so in other words that brick had to look like brick and behave as brick and suddenly we were like, and you know, a false povera. So everything had to build, be built with really cheap brick. And at the end of the day, they were, you know, maybe even if you were doing an extremely expensive house, you had to use that uh, cheap brick as a sense of uh, guilt, you know? Like, yeah, we're doing expensive, but uh, we're being, we're behaving here, right? So as an answer to that, we started to claim that, you know, you can build with many materials and form is not only related with one uh, particular material and the finishing of that material can be really diverse and nothing happens. So n one material is not as luxury and the other one is cheap, it's just how you use them. Uh, so yeah, it was a, actually a, quite a contextual answer.